Hey pals, I'm here today to wrap up some of the novels I've read in the past couple of months. I uploaded a video a few days ago where I spoke about six new 2024 novels and I reviewed and ranked them so I will link that video above. In this video I'm going to talk about nine more books that I've read. I have read some other books um, in the last couple of months but they're books I'm sort of reading for challenges and so I'm, I'm holding off on talking about those ones until I've finished the challenge. So yeah, these are all the other books in between. There's a real mix here. I think I've got three graphic novels slash memoirs, I've got two non-fiction books, I've got two books that were long list for the Woman's Prize and then the rest are sort of, uh, you know, uh, general fiction I think. So I initially planned, as I always do, to read the Woman's Prize for Fiction long list. I read a few of them and got kind of bored <laughs> of reading them and decided to just read the ones I was really interested in, which was still quite a few. And then I started to think, mm, maybe once a shortlist is announced, if there are ones that I'm interested in, I'll just read the shortlist. And I can say that I have read one book off the shortlist and really enjoyed it, DNF'd one book off the shortlist, and I'm halfway through another book off the shortlist. And the three other books have been shortlisted I wanted to read anyway. So I am intending to read and review the entire shortlist before the winner's announced. Will it happen? I don't know. I don't make promises anymore for these sorts of things. But yeah, I'm going to talk about two books that I read that didn't make the shortlist. And it's quite interesting because one of these was a book I'd previously planned to read. I'd borrowed it from the library in the autumn and didn't read it in time, took it back. And the other one is a debut novel and I had never heard of this book. So yeah, the first one is And Then She Fell by Alicia Elliott. This was the one I'd previously borrowed. I borrowed this one, I was really excited about this because I had read her a debut book which was a personal essay collection called A Mind Spread Out on the Ground which I would really recommend. Alicia Elliott is a Mohawk writer and in the book she writes about um, the difficulties, um, it's like an intersectional uh, personal essay collection about mental health, uh, degenerational trauma and what it's like being of mixed Mohawk and, and white heritage. Uh, gender, all sorts of things. It's, it's a really interesting collection. So I wanted to read whatever she brought out next. I was kind of surprised to see that it was a novel. So this is an interesting one because I've heard quite a few reviews for this and the sense I'm getting from people's reviews is that they preferred like the second half to the first. I preferred the first half. The premise of this is the novel opens with a, a teenage girl. Um, she's Mohawk and she lives in Canada and she's being pressured into being sexualized at a very young age. One evening she's babysitting um, a child, they're watching Pocahontas and she has an older boy who is planning to come around and see her and she assumes he will uh, you know try and make her have sex with him and Pocahontas, the character of Pocahontas, turns around from the TV screen and tells her she's making a mistake and to not let this boy come around. She thinks she's gone mad but she decides to trust um, this voice and she she tells him he can't come. Then we jump forward many years when this uh, young girl has become a woman, she is married to a white man and they've just had a child and they are living in this um, suburban area in Toronto where she feels very unwelcome, she's the only person of colour and she's very far from her reserve, it's the first time she's lived off uh, the reservation sorry and yeah she's really missing her family and her sort of cultural connections and when the book opens she's feeling uh, really lost and paranoid and she's sort of questioning everything because she's starting to distrust her husband and his intentions. He is a professor and he's really interested in her culture but he definitely tokenizes her and he's decided to study the Mohawk language because he thinks it will be great for his daughter to be able to speak her own language but our protagonist doesn't herself speak Mohawk so she feels like that's being taken from her and then also um, the neighbours and, and, and people in her husband's faculty um, treat her very differently, uh, clearly very racist. And as the novel moves forward, things start to happen that initially are realistic, but the protagonist is questioning whether she's just being paranoid or whether they're actually as bad as she thinks they are. But then they become things that could not physically happen. Like for example, and I think this will give you an idea of whether this is a book you want to read, um, uh, there's a talking cockroach. Now I guess if I'd known that up front I'd probably know this isn't a novel for me. So it goes some weird places okay and the underlying question, um, all these 
intersections of what the book is discussing, the way she's treated in terms of being a new mother, the traditional roles, what we expect from a mother and a father, uh, gender, um, her Mohawk ancestry, um, all these different things and the way she's being treated. There's an awful lot of prejudice and ignorance at play in this novel. We're being asked to question whether she's mentally ill and none of these weird and wonderful things are actually happening or if these weird and wonderful things are happening and if so what about the like realistic things in the middle like the racism and the sexism is that happening too in the middle of all this our protagonist is trying to write a uh, like a mohawk a creation story and she's she's writing that in a voice that we're as white people um not used to um hearing from you know we would assume um that we there would be this sort of sage older indigenous man telling these stories and instead there's this um young woman telling these stories with a much different tone than we would expect so i really like the first half of the novel this book is very conversational it's very easy to read it perhaps isn't what i was expecting based on her essay collection but i think i'd need to revisit the collection because i I wonder whether actually the collection was a bit more conversational than I remember it being. And so I, I thought that voice in particular worked well with her as a teenage girl. So I really enjoyed the opening of the novel, which I, I don't think a lot of people have enjoyed. But for me, where the big payoff is, which is in the back end of the novel, where lots of stuff happens, that's all I'll say, it, it fell apart a little bit for me because I didn't like some of the implications of what all that meant and I also felt that there was a period in the middle of the novel where about 50 pages could have been cut because there was just a lot of repetition and we just weren't moving forward in any way so this was a sort of a mixed bag for me I think I'd still I'd definitely still read any non-fiction she released and I think I'd give a uh, novel she released a go but I'd rather they were realistic um, than having any of this kind of bizarre stuff going on and, and that's just my preference as a reader. And the next one is In Defence of the Act by Effie Black. I'd never heard of this one and yeah this one is a is a pretty quick read. I read this I think in a couple of evenings. Now I don't know if I have this in my head because when I was reading this book I saw the announcement online that Jacqueline Wilson was writing a follow-on to the girls series but it was going to be her first adult novel. Now, I was a massive fan of Jacqueline Wilson. I read my favourite Jacqueline Wilson novels. I don't even know how many times I read them. And so I messaged uh, my Patreon Discord and we started chatting about Jacqueline Wilson and how excited we were and what our favourite Jacqueline Wilson books were. At the same time as I was reading In Defence of the Act, and I started to think, this is this a bit like how Jacqueline Wilson would write if she wrote for adults? Now, if you've read the book and you've read Jacqueline Wilson, what are your thoughts? Because is this just because they were happening at the same time in my life? I don't know. This book is, again, I think quite conversational, kind of informal. It's very easy to turn the pages. And that made me think of Jacqueline Wilson. But also, it's dealing with the type of families, the type of situations that Jacqueline Wilson dealt with for, for teenagers. Um, we're following this working class family who have uh, lots of troubles with the communication and yeah, just, just lots of struggles within the family. And that's the sort of stuff that Jacqueline Wilson writes like brilliantly about. And so yeah, so the premise of this book is that it is written in first person as though the narrator is talking to you as the reader. And that again, that adds to that conversational tone. And she is a behavioral ecologist who specializes in insects. I find this interesting because I studied wildlife conservation at university. We had a, a module on uh, behavioral ecology, mainly focused on insects because there is some like mad behavior stuff going on um, with lots of different insects out there. So I found that bit um, particularly interesting. Um, and she, she's trying to prove through her scientific research that suicide could be um, at some points a uh, a net positive for a species and some animals may commit suicide in order to further um, a benefit to their family all types of different things 
And there's reasons why she, she believes that. Throughout the novel, we're told about um, a few different um, people she knows in her life who committed suicide and sort of why um, that has led her to believe in, in her hypothesis. But then you sort of watch as she questions this hypothesis. I enjoyed this. I found it really readable. Um, I found the discussions interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in behavioural ecology, so I find that interesting. I thought the discussions around uh, suicide were really well handled. But this was one that I enjoyed at the moment. But I don't know if on a like a writing level this is really anything special it's interesting it's easy to read the characters are likable it's quite humorous which i liked made me think a little bit of emily austin's writing but yeah i don't know if this is anything particularly special and also again um i felt like the ending kind of undercut the premise of the rest of the book and don't know if I like agree with it essentially so yeah this is uh one I enjoyed again but a bit of a mixed bag but I'd definitely read whatever she brought out in the future um yeah just because this was uh quite a, I was gonna say a fun book to read I mean it's a, it's a really heavy book but it has quite a fun tone to it the characters are really interesting um voice to be in and so uh, yeah I'd read whatever this author wrote in the future I do agree with everyone that it has awful um font and I don't know why the publishers decided to go down that route. So yeah, there's that. Then for my Patreon book club in March, we read Please Look After Mother by Kyung Suk Shin. This is translated from the Korean by, oh my God, it's really hidden, by Ji Yong Kim. Um, it's mad that I haven't read this yet. This is like an incredibly popular um, book. Uh, she's, I think, one of the most famous um, Korean novelists and, yeah, I hadn't picked up any of her books. Um, so we read this for the book club and I, I won't talk about this much here because I've just uploaded like a really uh, spoilery review video talking about it over there. But I really enjoyed the premise of this. I enjoyed all the themes it explored. I enjoyed the way it unfolded. Um, there's, there's a device in this novel which is something that I really enjoy that I, I won't spoil here. But I didn't love the writing style. Um, I felt that it was kind of, and um, the sentences were quite simple, there's quite a lot of full stops. Um, and while there is like description, I could really picture all the surroundings. It's not like beautifully descriptive. And so I was really interested in these characters and like what had happened to the mother, but I didn't necessarily feel like a sense of warmthful connection um, because of the writing style. And that's just like a preference thing. I would maybe give another book from this author a go though in all honesty so let me know if you've read any of her other books and which one you would recommend I pick up. Then I'm going to talk about the three graphic books I read. The first one is a graphic memoir which I love graphic memoirs and that is Almost American Girl by Robin Ha. I enjoyed this one and, and this, these are the type of graphic memoirs I tend to read, a sort of coming of age story um, at a period in the author's life whether that's in childhood or um, early adulthood where they're realising something about themselves or there's like a big change in their in their family dynamics that leads them to have to yeah, like meet all these new people and be in this uh, new difficult situation, which is the case with this one. So um, this author was growing up in Seoul, Korea with a single mother, which is not common in Korea. And they went on a, uh, a summer holiday to Alabama. And when they got there, her mother was basically like, I'm marrying this man and so we're staying <laughs> and our author was obviously heartbroken because she had left all of her friends in Korea without saying goodbye and she couldn't speak any English she'd never met this man or his children and she didn't want this life and you follow on from that point as she uh, initially really struggles to make friends she has to learn this language really quickly just culturally obviously incredibly different countries but then you also watch as she starts to find her place as she discovers um, people around her who are also into comic books. And then I think what is presented really well in this is you see her start to understand her mother's decisions and how whilst it may feel like her mother doesn't let her have any uh, autonomy or any uh, involvement in the decisions made, actually the decisions that have been made 
like for the right reasons. Um, and so this sort of brings the author up to adulthood um, when she returns to Korea to, to visit some of her friends. So yeah, I enjoyed this one. I didn't love it. I've read graphic memoirs that deal with this topic um, and like I felt more connected to. But um, yeah, I enjoyed this. I um, like the illustration style. It's um, quite simple, um, quite sort of uh, washed out colours, which I quite enjoy. So yeah, if you like the sound of this, you enjoy these type of memoirs, I think this is one that's worth picking up. Then we have the incredibly beautiful Louis Undercover by Fanny Britt and Isabel Arsenault. So Fanny Britt is the writer, Isabel Arsenault is the illustrator, and this was translated from the French by Christelle Morelli and Susan Ori, because the author is French Canadian. So I have previously read a graphic novel um, made by this duo called Jane the Fox and Me. It is one of my favourite graphic novels. I love it. It's very slow. I highly recommend it. And so this came out I think a couple of years ago and I'd been intending to pick up a copy uh, but it was just super pricey so I eventually found this copy uh, second hand recently. So I absolutely adore the art style of this author. I love the, uh, the colour palette she uses. I love the font she uses. I just love everything about the choices she makes. Um, in this one in particular it is in grayscale with sort of washes of blue and then there are points in the graphic novel um, that are linked to certain parts of the story that are then in this really uh, vibrant yellow which is just beautiful. Um, so the premise of this one is that we are following um, this young boy and his brother just after their parents have recently separated um, They've separated because the father is an alcoholic, which is something our protagonist um, is aware of, but doesn't entirely understand. And they are going back to their uh, rural home to visit their father. And whenever they visit their father, he is he has these high highs where he's super happy and these low lows. And then when they come home to see their mother, she's struggling to get by. They're living in this cramped apartment in an urban setting. And yeah, everyone's kind of unhappy. Um, and Louis finds an escape in this girl at school who he thinks is beautiful and witty and smart and he's never spoken to her and so a lot of the book is about bravery it's about his father being brave enough to stop drinking his mother being brave that she's caring for them and sort of managing her emotions in ways their father isn't and Louis being brave and trying to speak to this young girl for me the storyline about the family was great and just the way the parents were drawn some of the sections about the mother in particular um, there's a section where she has like really sloped shoulders you can just see how tired she is um, there's a section where you can see that she's trying not to cry in front of the children like it's just beautifully drawn and you really get a sense of emotion um, through just their physicality on the page which I love I thought that like the storyline about the the girly fancies was maybe a little bit shoehorned in and what I'll also say is there is a raccoon on the cover. I love raccoons. The raccoon is a really tiny part of the story and in part I feel like maybe the raccoon was added because Jane the fox and me had a fox in and that's cute and so I want to have an animal in this one too. And I'm all for squeezing in cute animals where you can but I wish that maybe the raccoon had a bit more of a presence. I understand the point in the raccoon and what like the raccoon taught Louis, but I just wanted the raccoon to be more on the page. But yeah, I definitely recommend this. If you like the art on the cover, it is what you get. And um, she's one of my favorite illustrators and she's also illustrated some children's picture books, which I'll definitely be buying for my nieces when they're old enough. So yeah, there is that one. And then finally for graphic works, we have Crushing by Sophie Burrows. This is a silent graphic novel. It has no words. Uh, the story is told with pictures. So it's quite a simple story. But I think it has a lot of heart. I sat and uh, read this. It always feels weird to say read when there's no words, but it feels like that's what you're doing. One, I think Sunday afternoon um, with a cup of tea and a biscuit on my bed, um, surrounded by books I was planning to read. And it just felt delightful. Um, and I really enjoyed this one. So I would uh, definitely recommend picking it up if you like the sound of it. And I've realised something about myself and my preference in art styles, in graphic novels and memoirs, because this one again has a kind of uh, similar art style to Isabel Arsenault's work, quite sketchy and um, you can really see the lines on the page and 
this is all in grayscale as well except for the color red and like I said that's something I've enjoyed in Isabel Arsenault's art style um, but also in other graphic novels or memoirs I've read where it's all grayscale and then there's just one color that pops and that color usually signifies something. Now in this we're following a man and a woman who I guess are like in their 30s who both lead these really lonely lives. They're very isolated from people and they're very um, depressed. Like you can just see from the way they move from the world that they're really lonely and sad. And you just keep seeing these alternating scenes as they do really mundane things like go to Tesco's, go to a takeaway to pick up a kebab, walk through the park. And you see moments where they could possibly connect with one another. An example is that the woman drops her red glove and, and leaves it on the pavement. And then later on, the man walks past it and finds it. Um, and so you think, oh, they're obviously near one another. They're close enough that they could have bumped into one another. And yeah, it's just this, this book of these moments. And I, and I won't spoil where this goes, but it's very nice. And I really enjoyed it. Something else I really liked, and I, I've noticed that I like it in in novels in general is when an author isn't scared to really ground her book in a sense of its location so for example like rather than like give the supermarket some made up name it's very clearly a tesco's um it has all the tesco signage it has all the tesco's meal deal offers um and everything feels really recognizable and and i think the familiar for british readers adds that sense of warmth and nostalgia and I think if you're not a British reader then it gives it more of a sense of place because it feels so specifically British so yeah I, I really enjoyed this one and I need to look I think this is the only book she has but I need to look into that so yeah I'd recommend this one too. The next book I'm going to talk about is The List of Suspicious Things by Jenny Godfrey this is a recently released debut novel around 460 pages in print but it has very large font so if you've seen it physically and you've been intimidated by it then don't be. I thought there was a chance I would love this because it is a coming of age story which I love and it is about a girl from a, a working class British family which is you know in particular something I love reading about because it is quite familiar to me. I didn't love this one but I think there is a lot of good things to say about it and I would definitely read what this author released in the future. So premise of this is it opens in a small Yorkshire town in the late 1970s when the Yorkshire Ripper is still on the loose the police are really struggling for leads and people are getting more and more fearful about the safety of the women and girls in their life. We're following this young girl who I think is 11 or 12 called Miv who lives in a household with her mum who has got something wrong with her you don't know why Miv doesn't know why but her mum suddenly stopped talking and spends a lot of time in her bedroom doesn't really interact with the family doesn't really do anything other than just sit or sleep so because of that her, her aunt's moved in and she's sort of managing the household her aunt is a real busybody, she's a real gossip, she's incredibly judgmental, she doesn't like that there's a woman prime minister for example, has a lot to say about it. And you follow Miv as she, in order to really ignore what's going on in her own household, although she doesn't tell you that, she starts up a journal with her best friend called The List of Suspicious Things where they try to figure out who the Yorkshire Ripper is. The reason she's doing this is because her father has started murmuring about moving out of Yorkshire to get away from the Yorkshire Ripper and she does not want to leave her best friend. And so she thinks if we capture the Yorkshire Ripper, I don't have to move and we can continue being, you know, 10 minutes away from each other and going to school together. And so you then follow Miv and her best friend as they investigate all these different people and through their investigations you find out about a lot of people in the town, uh, people who are not the Yorkshire Ripper but are perhaps up to suspicious things or are perhaps not up to suspicious things and through watching them you understand the prejudices of the community. This book on the one hand has a real soft and warm feeling to it. Um, the descriptions of the, the family uh, and the interactions are the sort of stuff I love. Again, lots of descriptions of them sitting at the kitchen table to have dinner and them sitting in front of the television. Um, just lots of slice of life stuff that I really enjoy about the kids going out to play and things like that. 
and it has the feel of authors like Joanna Cannon and Cara Spray. But there is a lot of dark stuff going on in this novel and Johnny and I talk quite often to our parents about, you know, they would have grown up in this age range and I actually realised as I was reading this that my mum would have pretty much been the age of Miv when all this was happening, although she didn't live in Yorkshire. And we often talk about how some people of our parents' age talk about their childhood as though it was this idyllic era because they could go out and play a lot further and they felt much more free. But actually beneath all that there was a lot of horrible stuff going on that just nobody spoke about. And one of the things I think was the most buried was the idea that there were predators um, lurking in plain sight and getting away with doing things to young children that we just didn't talk about. They're not nice things, we don't talk about them. And there's a lot of discussion of those type of things in this novel. There's also um, a local man who runs um, the corner shop. Um, him and his son are grieving the loss of their mother and wife. And they are a Pakistani British family. And there's a lot of racism against them in the novel. And yeah, there's, there's lots of kind of violent and horrible things that happen within the story. Whilst it has this kind of lovely feel to it. So I enjoyed this. I was, quite, I was quite shocked by the ending, which I wasn't expecting, so it, it gets a plus for me for that. I felt this was a bit overly long. Um, I really did think this could have been a tighter novel and would have been stronger because of it. And yeah, I think maybe at points this was just a little bit too... Even though it deals with a lot of dark things, it does have that kind of sentimental feel to it. And in particular, there's something that happens at the end. I'm just going to say one word for people who've read the book, meeting, that I just thought was like too twee to be believable. And I didn't like that. Um, so, yeah, I would definitely read what this author brought out in the future. Um, and I really enjoyed it. And it had the chance to be a book I'd love. But there was just a couple of things that stopped me from um, all out loving this one. Then we have two newly released nonfiction books. The first one is Missing Persons or My Grandmother's Secrets by Claire Wills. I was hoping to love this one and when I read the first couple of chapters I thought this was going to be a five star read. I was in love and uh, sadly I ended up really not enjoying this one very much at all um, and I only finished it because of the brilliance of the first couple of chapters. I was hoping it would come back around to that and it never did. This is quite a short book, it's around 200 pages and it's about the fact that in 2015 the Irish government commissioned an investigation into the state's network of mother and baby homes after the discovery of a mass grave containing the remains of up to 800 children prompted international outrage. The homes, which operated from the 1920s to the 1990s, were responsible for nearly 9,000 child deaths and countless other abuses. Claire Wills began to look into this. She is first and foremost an Irish historian. She's written a lot of uh, historical non-fiction books about Ireland. And as she looked into this, she, she realised that her family had their own personal connection to it because she had a cousin that had been born in a mother and baby home and had led a very sad life. And her cousin's mother had been forced into a mother and baby home, uh, predominantly by Claire Will's own grandmother. And she'd never really heard about this, this aunt or this cousin. And so she decided to look into how this could have been allowed to happen, how it could be in plain sight but never discussed, how it could have happened in so many other Irish families, how pretty much everybody knew someone who knew someone who was in one of these mother and baby units and how everybody was complicit in putting these women in these places. And that sounds brilliant. And the first two chapters, like I said, it was, and then it loses itself. This felt to me like it could have been a brilliant essay, but she did not have enough content for a full book. It becomes very waffly. She just sort of starts to tell you about what sort of jobs her uncles would have done. Like you can tell that she's a social historian, very much interested in social history. I'm super interested in social history. I find all these sorts of things fascinating, especially when they're about working class families, which this book is. But there was just not enough of anything to, to, to hold on to. It, it sort of danced, it waffled a bit here. It read like you were gonna get more information and she was gonna go deeper and she never really does. Towards the end, she starts to ask some interesting questions about whether it's her right to tell this story. Um, and she never really goes anywhere with that. So I would skip this one. I've had a few books, non-fiction books on my TBR for years about these mother and baby units. 
and this is just a reminder that I should have read one of them instead of this one so yeah wouldn't recommend this sadly because I was so excited about it um yeah wasn't that good in the end and I'll save this one for last because it's going to be a really difficult one to talk about and I'm going to be upfront about this book having a ton of trigger warnings and um it being a book that I think a lot of people wouldn't want to read so um hence I've saved it for the end then that is Rabbit Heart A Mother's Murder A Daughter's Story by Christine S Irvin so just trigger warnings up front because I will need to discuss these things while I review this book this book deals with the abduction of a woman and the violent killing of her and it goes into graphic detail about that and also I wasn't expecting um this author is the daughter of the woman who was murdered and she herself goes through some pretty um awful uh, moments of, of sexual assault in her life and it's just in quite a lot of um situations at which she's being taken advantage of and, and they feel unsafe and there's a lot of discussions of the violence in particular sexual violence committed by men uh, towards women and it's pretty much constant in this book it was not I was not expecting it to be this difficult to read and um, there was a lot of points with this one where I would read 30 pages and think right that's enough for today so yeah I just want to be upfront about that now everyone has a different um level with with these type of books but like this book was yeah like a little bit past the level I would want to read um and so yeah I'm putting that out there so I heard about this book I initially saw the title and cover and thought absolutely if you've watched my channel for any length of time you know that I have um I have a lot of interest in I don't like true crime in terms of like that sort of salacious detail people just love to hear about the worst things they can hear um, I think it's kind of horrible how true crime always centres the perpetrators um, and loses the voice of the victims within that and forgets that the victim have like surviving friends and family who don't want um, yeah, these horrible details broadcast to the world. What I am interested in is books, documentaries, podcasts that explore how moral all that is and instead centre the victim and are interested in talking about who the victim was rather than just the moment of their death and are interested in looking into how as a society we allow these crimes to happen because I think that is deeply interesting and is something we need to resolve. So um, one of my favourite memoirs is After the Eclipse by Sarah Perry which I'll put a picture of here, I need to reread this book, I love it and it has a similar premise um, Sarah Perry was a young child um, in her home when there was a home invasion and her mother was brutally attacked and killed while Sarah Perry was hiding in her room and heard it all and the book is about Sarah Perry living with this unsolved crime and what it's like to to be somebody who has been through that and see women's bodies plastered everywhere like we do women's bodies that have undergone horrific violence and that to be so normal that you can like be at the gym and there can just be like a, a police drama on the television and you just hear about like the brutal rape of the woman that's just like normal and every day and people discuss these things like they're normal and every day like oh my god have you heard this latest podcast oh god isn't it horrible like you can't get away from hearing these things and so that book looks into that but also is is in particular discussing who her mother was not just as a mother but as a person as an individual um, and how all of that was lost in this investigation and it is beautiful it is wonderfully written I highly recommend it and if this one sounds like this is definitely a much harder read and um, then but, but you're interested in these themes then I would go for after the eclipse because yeah one of the things Sarah Perry isn't really interested in is is focusing on that last violent moment of her mother's life because there was of course so much more to her mother rabbit heart i was expecting to be along those lines it isn't i i this i mean i'm not gonna say i enjoyed it this is a really well written memoir i would probably read anything this author brought out in the future but it's yeah pretty horrible so so this I guess is a, a book of kind of two halves the first half is focused on 
um, the moment when this author found out about what happened to her mother, she was eight years old, and growing up and becoming a woman. And I really liked, liked, again, hard word, uh, I found that a really strong part because she's focusing on how you can be the child of a woman who has been through something like that, a violent crime committed by men against women, and you can still have a father who is rubbish at dealing with raising a young girl, is rubbish at protecting his daughter from these things. Examples are, um, one of her doctors says inappropriate things to her, and when she tells her father about it, he's like, sounds fine to me, but if you feel uncomfortable, then you should tell the receptionist, but that might make it a bit awkward for you when you need to go to the doctors again. Like, stuff like that. Like, he always, he very much instills the patriarchy. He even talks about wanting to uphold the patriarchy. And he, you know, always puts the blame at Christine's door if a man is being inappropriate. And so Christine becomes someone who is in a lot of situations where there is an abuse of power and there are some moments in this in her life that have been like horrific in terms of sexual assault which are described on the page and she it's a really difficult book to read in terms of the headspace she must have been in as a person because a lot of times she says she puts herself in these moments in order to like feel as close as she possibly can to like what her mother went through because she has this desire to understand it and her desire to understand it leads her to these really dark places and also she has this because of the world she lives in and how we're told that like a woman's worth and a girl's worth is based on her desirability she wants to be desirable she wants to be wanted by men and she sees that as as, a, as powerful and so the first half of the book really sits in that headspace and is very difficult to read but I thought incredibly well written I think she was this is a really hard book to have written because some of the stuff she sort of reveals about herself are not things most people would want to talk about or would probably ever feel comfortable like even talking to a therapist about so like she really goes there and the second half of the book is more focused on the fact that her mother's um, murder was unsolved for many years um, and then many years later they started to get some leads and the second half of the book is focused on on that on the case um, on the trial and how her family felt about it all being brought uh, to the surface again and what they felt they wanted like what what was enough for them did they want revenge did they want justice did they want to forget and again all of that was really interesting i found it quite difficult to read some of those sections because i for many years now have been someone who doesn't really believe in the justice system we have doesn't really agree with the justice system as a form of punishment I think we should get to people way before these crimes happen fix all the social issues put all the money into that and then the majority of crimes committed would not be committed um, a lot of people who commit crimes do so because of past traumas but when it's really difficult to hold that belief when you're being told about this person who has committed some horrific acts against women and you're reading it from the perspective of the daughter of one of those women who wants this man to go through hell. So yeah, the second half was an interesting look into what it would be like as a family to go through that and some really difficult questions are asked. And the book throughout, like Christine's really interested in a woman's voice being heard, in the fact that a lot of the time um, her brother and her father are the, the people who are given a voice in these situations and that's something that is continuously interrogated which I very much appreciate so can't say I enjoyed this but it is if you're interested in those themes it's a very interesting examination of them she can certainly write and there are some really beautiful moments of writing in this in particular when you're told what the title means and I could really see everything she described and yeah like it's super hard hitting I think it achieves what it sets out to achieve but it was a lot so there's that one like read with caution um, I'd be interested in if you've read it and what you thought of it um, 
yeah so there we go those are the nine books i have read recently that i wanted to catch up and review for you guys i'd love to know if you've read any of them and if so what your thoughts were on them and any recommendations you feel like giving me based on the books i uh, reviewed i would love to hear them thanks for watching and i'll see you in the next video bye